Okay, we want to ask a huge favor of all of our friends out there listening to the podcast. Three things that I want you to do. I want you to, number one, leave a review. Leave a, well, actually, let me clarify and let me be very specific. <laughs> leave a five-star <laughs> review <laughs> and also write a written review that praises <laughs> this podcast. Oh my gosh. Okay. Um, no, wow, actually, that's a big favor to ask. Oh gosh. Well, you don't have much self-confidence. No, there, it Aaron. just, I mean, that's like, Hey, can you say some nice things about me? Oh yeah. Yeah. I have no problem <laughs> asking that because I know all these people listening have wonderful thoughts about mm. you and me in this podcast. <laughs> and, um, and some of them have asked this podcast into their heart. <laughs> <laughs> and so we want you to write a review. And actually what that helps us do is it helps us, number one, it helps Erin to feel better about herself. <laughs> oh number two, it helps the all-knowing, all-seeing algorithm, I'm told. Uh, no, it helps spread the word on the podcast. As we get reviews, uh, you know, people look at reviews and that helps to us uh, to spread the word. So that's one small thing you could do. Uh, leave a review. Uh, also, subscribe. Subscribe on your podcast platform. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, hit the subscribe uh, button there. Uh, and ring the bell, as the kids say. <laughs> and then thirdly, also, uh, you can donate to support this podcast. Maven is a 501c3. We are donor supported. And so if, if you are finding the benefits of this, you want to help continue to uh, to give this resource to other parents out there, we would encourage you become one of our monthly supporters. Okay. So those are the three things that you can do. And, uh, uh we just want to encourage you right up front in this episode, because we don't want to say this at the end because we don't want you to check out, you know, and just like <laughs> stop the podcast. Um, well, today's podcast <laughs> is, I think a really important podcast. This is more important than probably any other podcast we've ever done. <laughs> I was um, going to say, do you do you feel that in your heart? I that feel that about the every, most important podcast. I, yeah, I feel that about every podcast <laughs> in, in deep in my heart. Deep in your heart. Yeah. Um, look, it's no secret that the kids are not okay. And when I say the kids, I specifically mean our kids. <laughs> okay, our kids. No, our That's kids a are given. Well, a few of our kids are okay. <laughs> Number two and number five, <laughs> I worry about those two. Um, no, people ask have asked me because oftentimes when I, I'll if I even enter, you know, if the kids are with us and I introduce them, I'll say this is number three and this is, and they're like, do you really refer? And I'm like, absolutely, of course I refer <laughs> to them as numbers. It's much easier. Trying to go through all the names is just difficult. Yeah, and it's personal. And we try to keep things impersonal, <laughs> really impersonal in our family. Especially when it comes to our kids. <laughs> uh, but no, in general, in American culture, the kids are not okay. Okay. And, and so we have seen the, tons of evidence on this. Uh, number one, you just you know open up any news app, look uh, at any news site. Week after week after week, there is article after article, study after study that's done on our kids. And you can look at this at all kinds of different objective levels. You can look at the rates of anxiety, depression, self-harm, suicide, the ages at which these things happen. So the kids aren't okay. Um, and, you know, there, there's a lot of talk about the mental health crisis, right? And, and yet it seems like our culture has become a, uh, a very therapeutic culture where we focus. There's a, a whole lot more conversation on mental health and a focus on mental health than there ever was mm -hmm. 30, 40, 50 years ago. And we see that creep into th those ideas creep into parenting. And so, um, you know, even in parenting, we're now we're a lot. We're, we're very concerned about our kids' mental health. When which, we were growing up, do you remember it was... Um there was a big self-esteem movement. Yeah. And that, it, you know, so different trends or whatever come come about. But in the 80s and 90s, remember, that was a big, like there was self-esteem yeah. curriculum. Self-esteem, self-image. Mm -hmm. But I remember, I remember that for sure being a big push when yeah. we were growing up. Yeah. And so um, clearly 
things have gotten worse for our young people in terms of their heart, mind, soul, okay? Um, we've seen a greater emphasis on it. And I, well, I think what we want to do today is we want to take a piece of this. Now, there's, there's a larger story here. There's more to address than we're going to be able to address in this podcast. But we want to take a piece of this that I think is key, mm-hmm. uh, we think is key. And it's a, a false dichotomy that's often made in these conversations about kids' mental health, about their behaviors, about you know who they are, what they're doing, right? And uh, their heart is kind of the term that is used in our, our culture, right? So their heart and this dichotomy between that and the rules, requirements, obedience, boundaries, you know, regulations, whatever you want to call them. And there's this very sharp divide between those two things. And so what we hear when it comes to parenting or discipling our kids is that we don't want to merely control their behavior or we don't merely want to get them to obey us but we want to get to the heart of the matter. We want to focus on their heart. In fact, I was just listening to uh, a live stream where the leader, this, this leader was addressing social media, social media use, smartphone use. And he said uh, basically that having rules for your kid's smartphone will not change their heart. And their heart is the real issue. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of this dichotomy, this very sharp dichotomy between the heart and the rules or the boundaries or obedience or those kind of things. And the most important issue is the heart. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, I think for many of us, uh, we've grown up just kind of absorbing that message. Many of us, uh, we, we probably have bought into that in various ways. And, uh, and so we want to examine that because, I mean, I'll show my hand right up here at the, the beginning. Like, we think this is a bad idea. <laughs> uh, and so now the, the problem is for a lot of us is that we have so absorbed that message and that way of thinking that it may take us a little bit to disentangle from it. Mm-hmm. Because I'm, I'm guessing that even some people who are hearing this right now may be thinking, oh, wait a second. I'm not sure I'm going to agree with, you know, Brett and Aaron on this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm thinking about how this, this, that tweet in particular, but we've seen it in so many areas in Christian books, Christian seminars, parenting magazines, this, this idea of, Hey, don't focus on their behavior, focus on their heart and how that is, it can be manipulative because, of course, you you hear that like, don't focus on your kid's behavior with their smartphone. Smartphone, you want to get to their heart, and yeah. the, the the initial response is, well, of course, the the whole point of having them have boundaries with their phones, at least for those of us parents that do ha- put boundaries on our kids' phones. The, that is our goal. And so that we get to their heart and we're going to define, uh, and that's the thing too, we're going to define what that means, but oftentimes it's not defined. So it's just kind of thrown out there. Hey, you shouldn't be just focused on their, their outside behavior. You need to be focused on the inside. So you're left wondering, okay, so how do I get in there? And, How do I get into the heart? Well, and what what is in there? <laughs> yes, and and so it, it it makes it sound like the outside behaviors don't really matter. It's actually what's going on inside that parents should care about. Yeah, and so it like we've talked about like this. So it it puts up for parents kind of this false dichotomy, this false idea that the outside doesn't matter. It's the inside that matters. That needs to be our focus. But then I think we're constantly left with, okay, how do I get in there? How do I get to their heart? Cause that, okay. Yeah. That's what I want to mold. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's what I want to shape their heart. So, so how do I get to that? Because it's communicated that the, when it's communicated this way, it's as if the heart is the core issue and the other stuff, they might not say, well, behavior doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. They might say, well, it just doesn't matter as much. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you can't change any behavior unless you get into that core, the heart, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Now I was actually going to put our listeners on the spot and what I'd love for our listeners to do right now is define heart as it's used in the culture. If we say, if we said something like, Hey, don't focus on your kid's behavior, focus on their heart. Okay. Define heart. And I'm going to pause. We're going to pause here for, let's pause for a minute. Just have absolute <laughs> silence. Because I want our listeners, I want all of us to feel a little uncomfortable. Because I think um, we may, number one, have trouble defining that. Or what we're going to do is we're going to define it in a way that modern kind of Western culture defines it. Mm-hmm. Right? What's the modern view? The modern view is that heart has to do with your emotions, your feelings, your affections. It's kind of the, the, the right-brained approach versus the left-brained approach. Mm-hmm. It's not the logical side of things. It's the feeling side of things. Mm-hmm. And so when we talk about heart, we think emotions, feelings, you know, desires, those kinds of things. Yeah, we think about, when we think about getting to our kid's heart, We think about, okay, for the example of the smartphone, I think we think about a picture of where they themselves emotionally are convicted and, and put down the phone and, and want to do this on their own. And so it's, it's Mm -hmm. this, this desire that, that they'll, that they'll do it on their own. That's when we've now gotten to the heart or, you know, you think about when you say heart, of course, that's what we think about. You think about the camp high experience. You think about the, you know, I've heard it in, in respect to discipline too. Like we want to get to the heart. So how do you do that? How do you help sibling? How do you help your kids love each other? You know? And so it's like, how do you how do you get your kids to want to treat each other well instead of you having to force them? And and so you picture this this picturesque setting of the siblings hugging each other or forgiving each other and and that sort of thing. That's what you think of when you think of the heart. Yeah, and I think kind of key what what you said is key that's tied into this. It have you know, things that have to do with the heart. You know, one of those aspects is them wanting to do it on their own mm-hmm. versus you quote unquote forcing them to do it. Yeah. Now this is where there are partial truths here, mm-hmm. right? In one sense, absolutely. We want to affirm that we want to get our kids to a place where they want to do what is right and what is good and that it flows from their heart. heart right. <laughs> um, the question is what is that heart and how do you get them to get to that point of wanting to do it. And somehow you've got now this modern dichotomy that it's somehow severed and disconnected from the rules and obedience. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you got your modern view. Uh, What we need to do with these kinds of things is obviously go back to scripture, right? Scripture as our ultimate authority on these matters Scripture as a description of reality, Scripture should uh, be our our guiding light here Mm -hmm. when it comes to this. And so you've got your definition of heart or what you've absorbed, what we've absorbed in, in the culture. So now let's take it and let's compare it to the biblical teaching. Yeah, because if if God is the creator of all things, including human beings, including the children in our homes and churches. If he created them, then he will know how to get to their heart, right? He's, he's made them. And so that, that's one thing that I, I think we, you know, it's not just, well, we go to the Bible, like, like a Sunday school answer, like you said, we're going there because it describes reality, because it's the words of the creator who made us, 
And so there will be insight on how to live in there and how to raise our kids and how as parents, we what our goal and aim should be for our kids. And it it turns out the scripture actually gives us a lot of insight on this area. Yeah. So at this point, you know, don't don't check out on this. This is the most important thing to do here is to start exploring the scripture uh, and, and getting a clear picture now on what the Bible means and what God means when we talk about the heart. Now, uh, and and what you were ta- and I were talking about this kind of prior to the podcast, but it's just when we do this, it actually helps to reveal how off we are <laughs> in our thinking, how mo- our modern thinking does not match up with biblical thinking. So scripture can be confrontive mm-hmm. uh, in a good way. It confronts our modern notions and helps us to see how we're off track. Now, here are some different ways. And I, I guess this is kind of, I'm, I'm trying to throw a, a, you know some stones in the shoe for a, a second here and just get uh, some references out there that show the different ways that the word heart is used in the Bible, right? And so take the modern view, heart, emotion, feelings, right? Uh, and compare, contrast it with this. So you have a passage like Mark chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, where it refers to um, this encounter with Jesus and these people questioning, I believe it's the Pharisees in that, that uh, passage, it says, questioning in their hearts. Now just pause there. Think about what's linked together. Questioning in their hearts. Not questioning in their minds, questioning in their hearts. Okay. So again, I'm just throwing it out. There's like a little stone to say, wait a second, this might upset or uh, throw off some of the modern definitions we have. Uh, you have Job 22.22, 22, which says, lay up words in your heart. Well, no, the words are in the mind, aren't they? And the, the feelings are in the heart. But here you have a biblical reference that says, lay up words in your heart. Acts chapter 2, verse 26. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. Uh, my flesh also will dwell in hope. So now there you have a passage where you'd say, yeah, there are some emotions, it seems like, that are involved. Gladness, rejoicing. Here's another one, Ezra 7.10. It says, for Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. So he set his heart to do what? To study. Okay, so there's another kind of, uh, you say, wait, wait, those don't go together in the modern definition. Or Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So now you have kind of a, an attitude, a disposition, a, a humility that's connected with the heart. Okay, now you've got 1 Kings 9, 4 that says, and as for you, if you walk before me as, your, uh, as David, your father walked, with integrity of heart and uprightness, doing according to all that I have commanded you and keeping my statutes and my rules. So here you have heart linked with uh, moral character, with obedience, living according to all that I have commanded you. So I, I throw out that kind of diversity of passages to show that uh, w- the, the the Bible uses the heart in a different way than we use it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's so much deeper than the be true to your heart kind of slogan that is just everywhere in culture, especially to kids, don't you think? I mean, that's that's the whole slogan on, of course, a lot of Disney movies, and but it's not just Disney, obviously. It's, it's all the all, music in every kind of genre of music. It's like, follow your heart, be true to your heart. And the heart, when it's used that way, seems to be your emotional urges. Yeah, your feelings. Your feelings. It's what you feel inside. Yeah. That's what you follow. But here, (laughs) biblically, that's not the case. Yeah, it's, it's so much, it's so much more than that, which actually then is helpful in thinking about, um, just when we hear the word heart used, that our our instinct should be, well, what do you mean by that? Yeah. 
wherever we hear it. If we hear it in a sermon, if we hear it in a parenting book, anywhere we hear it, when someone says you should be concerned about the heart or bring up the heart, we need to know what they mean because there is so much confusion um, in the culture. And, and even there's so, the heart is mentioned so much in the scriptures that we really need a robust study of it and an understanding of it to even grasp what people are talking about when they say anything about the heart. Yeah. In fact, when you look at the scripture, yeah, heart is used a lot more so than the mind, more, more so than emotion or feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, okay, what what is this term? Because just from a short little survey of these scriptures, we've got something that's much broader. Mm-hmm. It's much broader than just our emotions. It's broader, it's more broad than uh, our living obediently. It's it's broader than our thinking, <laughs> right? So, so what is it? Okay, so let's look at the word for heart that's used in the Old and New Testament. And this is where you don't have to be a theologian. Uh, you just have to have the right tools and rely upon the good theologians who have done this work for us. Yeah. So we've just got the Expository Dictionary of Bible Words. So this is a great resource that I use uh, sometimes when uh, I, you know, I teach at our church or um, for my own study. Mm-hmm. If you if you uh, have a Bible dictionary, you can kind of take different words. And then look in the Bible dictionary, find that word, and it will give you, okay, here's how it's used in the Old Testament. Here's the word that's often used. Here are the variations. And here's how it's used in the New Testament. And it will give you a sense of the biblical meaning of that word. Yeah. So we looked up heart. Well, I just want to say first that um, I think every Christian home should have a, a commentary and a dictionary to help in our study of the scriptures because the scriptures were written in different languages than what we're speaking right now, English. And so to understand... They were originally written in Spanish. (laughs) To understand the Hebrew words for the Old Testament and the Greek words for the New... it's, It's important for us to... We don't have to speak or be able to read them, although that would be great, but we can depend on scholars who do understand the language and and really understand the meaning of the words, and that helps us to, to understand what we're actually reading. Because not only were they written in different languages, they were these things were written down many thousands of years ago, too. So different times and different, different places. Culture. So it's important to understand the culture yeah. a lot of times in the in the times these were written. Yeah. And I just want to say. I see Bible dictionaries and commentaries all the time at used bookstores. So I just want to say that because a lot of times we suggest books and resources and we, a lot of the books and resources we have in our home, we have gotten, and by we, I mean me, at a (laughs) used bookstore. I I go to used books. I love used bookstores. (laughs) Who goes to use bookstores more? You. Me. So anyway, I, because we have been a one income family, basically our whole marriage, we've always been on a limited budget and I want books. And so we've, we've been able to find you sometimes, me a lot, used books for as wonderful resources. So I just want to plug that because sometimes it's like, oh my gosh, how can I buy all these things? But you can find you can find things. Uh, Thrift Books is another is a website. I get books from too. So anyway, just an encouragement that way. But to have these resources in your home for your own study, and then when your kids ask questions about what does this scripture mean, what what on earth does this word mean, it's a wonderful resource just as a parent to mm-hmm. look up and say, I'm not sure what that means. Let's look into it. Okay. Yeah. So. The heart in the in the Old Testament. You want to do Old Testament? Yeah, let's start with the Old Testament. Okay, so the heart in the Old Testament is the word leb. I think it's leb. Leb. I, I think that's how you would pronounce it in the Hebrew, but I am not a Hebrew <laughs> scholar. I actually did not take uh, Hebrew in my uh, <gasps> master's program. Oh my gosh. So I am very ignorant of Hebrew, but I think that one is, is leb. Leb. So... 
Um, it's usually found, it says here in the NIV and NASB, is read as heart. And so th- this the Hebrew word is often translated as heart. And so it's in the Hebrew, this word lib is broad and it's an inclusive term. So we're being inclusive, actually. I just want to pause here. <laughs> we have now uh, fulfilled our <laughs> DEI quota for using the word inclusive in our podcast. We want to do it once a in year. In a positive way. Yeah. We've said inclusive. You see, we're inclusive. <laughs> and the biblical term for heart is inclusive. So, so the Hebrew thought when it comes to heart, this this is explaining is it's really about the unity of the person. It looks at the human being as a whole and expresses all of these and other inner human functions of the word. So it says the Hebrew lieb is a broad, inclusive term. In our culture, we tend to divide a human being into isolated functions, such as spiritual, the intellectual, the emotional, the rational, and the volitional. But Hebrew thought maintains the unity of the person. It looks at a human being as a whole and expresses all of these and other inner human functions by the use of the word lieb. In the Old Testament, the heart is thus the conscious self, the inner person with every function that makes a person human. Okay, so there we have a definition that is much more broad. And as the dictionary says, it's also inclusive. And so I just want to pause here and recognize that we have (laughs) now satisfied the Maven Parent Podcast DEI (laughs) uh, standards, Mm -hmm. and we have used the word inclusive once this year. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are a very inclusive podcast. We are an inclusive podcast. Um, So what about the New Testament? So, well, uh, you know what, there's, and maybe we can link to this, because uh, someone who says, yeah, I don't have a Bible dictionary, but they want to... They want to look a little bit more into mm-hmm. this. Uh, there's a paper online written by David Noggle, and David Noggle has written some good worldview books. And in this paper, he talks about the Old Testament and New Testament uh, usage of, of of the heart. And what he says is in agreement with what you've read there. Uh, he says the preponderance of biblical passages uh, speak of the heart as the central defining element of the human person. And he goes on to say, to know a person's heart is to know the actual person, right? Um, and so this uh, this includes a person's essential self, right? So here, this idea of it's, it's a much more broad, inclusive term. Now, in modern you know, in just modern language, and we do, and we, you and I do this on the podcast, we do separate, right? Spiritual, intellectual, rational, volitional. So we'll talk about the mind, mm-hmm. or we'll talk about our volition or our will. And so, and that can be helpful in some ways, but what we're doing here is saying, hey, when scripture uses this term heart, it is not doing that. It's not separating out emotions, it's actually including all of those things. And that's why just you know, a few minutes ago when I surveyed all those different passages, heart can be used in all of those different uh, situations, whether it's questioning in the heart, laying up words in your heart, uh, obedience, emotion, being glad, uh, and on and on and on. Those all fit this broad, inclusive view of the heart. And so, yeah, now we can go to the New Testament. What do we see in the New Testament, Aaron? Well, it turns out the New Testament is consistent with the Old Testament. So heart in the New Testament, the Greek cardia is used in the Old Testament sense. So the Greek word cardia that we find in the New Testament is used in the Old Testament sense with all the meanings found there. The heart of the man is the very person his psychological core, the conscious awareness each of us has that makes us persons and the spiritual dimension of responsiveness or unresponsiveness to God are both expressed by the word heart. And then it says this significant term occurs 158 times in 158 New Testament passages, so yeah. a lot. Yeah, and David Noggle in that that paper that we linked to, 
Uh, he says the New Testament and the teaching of Jesus advance this perspective, advance the perspective of the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. The 150 or so uses of heart, cardia, from Matthew to Revelation, demonstrate that it is the main organ of psychic and spiritual life, the place in man at which God bears witness to himself, the whole of the inner being of man in contrast to his external side, the one center in man to which God turns in which the religious life is rooted, which determines moral conduct. Mm -hmm. And he actually takes that uh, from the theological dictionary of the New Testament. That's Mm -hmm. his source on that. So key point here, Jesus shares the Old Testament point of view, Mm -hmm. that the heart is this spiritual center of the person, and all of life orbits around that. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, it is the core of the person, but that core includes the rational, the moral, the volitional, the emotional, the affections, all of that's included in that biblical term heart. Mm -hmm. And there, um, you know, one book that talks about this is Dallas Willard's book, Renovation of the Heart, which is a great book if you're looking for a book on kind of spiritual formation. It's a very thoughtful book. He actually talks about, uh, this is in chapter two, uh, the heart, there's a subsection, the heart directs the life. And he talks about um, the heart, here's how he describes it on page 30, the human heart, will or spirit, and so there's these different ways in which uh, you know heart captures all those things, and those things are used sometimes synonymously with heart. The human heart, will, or spirit is the executive center of a human life. The heart is where decisions and choices are made for the whole person, right? So it's kind of the center of all of our functioning. All right, so now we have clearly a biblical view of the heart that is in contrast to our modern ideas about the heart. And so when we talk about uh, ideas... When, when Paul in Romans 12, 2 says, uh, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? Or when there's a connection between the heart and obedience, right? We now have a more fuller picture. And we can say worldview is a matter of the heart, mm-hmm. right? Obedience is a matter of the heart. Mm-hmm. Uh, all of these things play together. And we don't have this sharp contrast or this dichotomy that we make in modern American culture, which influences how we talk about parenting and discipling kids and, and, and actually can undermine, when we have an improper view, it will undermine our efforts with our kids. Yeah. We'll shoot ourselves in the foot. Well, it, it, can, it can make us think false things. Uh, I think one thing that's important for us to understand what the heart is and kind of the, okay, if the issue is the heart of our children, how do we get to that? You know, you could see how if you misunderstand the heart, you can think that what we do doesn't matter because it's all about their heart. So it's kind of, it's all about their emotional life. So we just have to kind of nurture emotions a little bit and well, or validate feelings yes right that's the big oh yeah that's kind a of huge idea push. and phrase yes. out there mm-hmm. the first step in dealing with your child's behavior is to first validate their feelings mm-hmm. we've just absorbed that and i would i i think probably the majority of parents out there would they hear that and they just we go along with it or we think yeah that's right now first step is give, give my kid an opportunity to share their emotions, and and then I validate their feelings. Mm -hmm. Now, just pause. First thing to do with that idea is to take it back to Scripture. Evaluate that idea from the Scriptures. Is that what we see in the Scriptures? That, you know, when it comes to our behavior or our actions or, you know, rebellion or whatever it might be, children's behavior, that Scripture instructs parents to first validate feelings. Now, I'm going to leave that as an open question at the moment, but my my point there is I want to nudge us 
not just nudge us. I want to shove us <laughs> right back to the scriptures mm -hmm. and let's evaluate all of our modern psych psychology according to the scriptures. And if you listen to this podcast, you know we have no problem with psychology. Yeah. Right. I mean, we had J.P. Moreland on to talk about anxiety and depression and all those things. Uh, we think psychology needs to be rooted in a Christian worldview. What we have a problem with is secular psychology that's divorced from a Christian worldview. Because I think I think when that I think when that advice is given about validating feelings, there's a disconnect between the the feelings people have so our kids and and reality so it's like we you just you just validate the feeling and whether or not it's connected with reality it doesn't really matter mm -hmm. it just you just validate that and i think also too i'm thinking about in the different curriculums and books and things that i've heard about it it's it's put up in contrast with the authoritarian parent who doesn't even consider the child. Mm, it's yes. just, so this old, this old picture, and maybe it's not old to some people listening because maybe they grew up with parents like this, where it didn't matter what you felt about anything. Your parents didn't seem to consider you. It was just kind of my way or the highway, blah, blah, blah. You know, and so it's this, so it's contrasted with, you don't want to be like that. Mm. And so then you need to be like this. Yeah. And of course, that picture, that authoritarian, you know, you think mostly of a dad, frankly, that is just like, I don't care. Uh, I about bet there's you a lot of all. a lot of people out there who think of a mom. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. I, I get so. I'm just saying in the, my mind, I just picture it like a stern father. like a stern, yeah, dad. Which yeah. my dad was actually the opposite, but I just think the caricature is often like a dad who just comes home from work, doesn't care what the kid, you know, that kind of thing. But anyway, just that this ugly picture well, of a I, parent who doesn't love the child as a human person. Yeah. Let me throw out the terms that are used, right? So you have what's sometimes referred to as you mentioned one word, the authoritarian parent, mm -hmm. or sometimes it's referred to as tiger parenting, right? Where you're really driven and you're stern and you, you know, you keep, you prevent your kid from having the fun that they want to have. And because you're dri you know, driving them for whatever it might be, academic success mm -hmm. or, and, and then gentle parenting, mm -hmm. right? And so you have this contrast and yeah, Not, what none kind of, us, of parent do you want to be? I don't want to be the tiger parent. I don't want to be the authoritarian. I don't want to be the stern parent. I don't want to be the angry parent, right? That's that's the the caricature. Well, what's what do we have in contrast? Oh, the gentle parent. Oh, that, I want to be that, mm -hmm. right? And of course, we all, well, I, I, maybe we all don't want to, but I, I'd say the majority <laughs> of parents, good parents, right? Godly parents, parents who love their kids, they want to be more gentle Consider and patient it. and kind. Yeah. But this is another false dichotomy. Don't buy into those categorizations. And this is where you go back to Jesus. Jesus was at times gentle. And, and we would say loving. There were times when Jesus was stern and forceful. And, and he And he goes <laughs> into the temple and he overturns tables. And you stole my my punchline there, and I was going to say, <laughs> and loving, <laughs> right? We need to characterize both of those as loving mm -hmm. and not buy into this gentle, validate gentle feelings mm -hmm. or stern, angry, driven, don't listen to your kids. Mm -hmm. That's a false dichotomy, okay? Yeah. All right, now, uh, and, and that's where I guess maybe kind of to wrap this up, don't, don't let the pendulum swing, Okay, and, and as you listen to us, I, I think what we're trying to help do is break some of those categories, shatter some of that first, because that will, if you're stuck in those categories, that it's either gentle parenting or it's authoritarian parenting, then when we start talking about obedience, it's well, and you only have those two categories, well, you're going to have to fit that into one of those categories. Yeah, and you live in this culture today and 
you want you want to love your kids. And so if loving is always on the pendulum of you're saying gentle or permissive or whatever word you want to put Although over there. Gentle parents would argue that they're not permissive. Well, right. I'm just saying the the pendulum of the you use the tiger mom, mm-hmm. the tiger parent that just kind of has these goals for their kid and it it the goal is the goal and that's what the kid's going to do no matter what. But anyway, so you think about in this culture in this time, of course, as a parent you want to love your kid. How does culture tell you to love your kid? They say love means affirmation um gentleness you're never you're never angry even if even if there's times where there's legitimate t- things to be angry about it's like no 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 it's always this calm let me legitimize your feelings let me meet you where you're at kind of thing mm-hmm. and, and and not let a lot me of primarily express my feelings too Cause that's a lot of the stuff you hear in gentle parent is like when you did this, that's the way you talk to you. When you did this, mm-hmm. it made me feel like this. Mm-hmm. Right. And you lead with your feelings. Right. So you could see why we're in a little bit of a trouble here as parents, because then it's like, well, what do we do? Well, that's why we want to, as you said, not nudge, but push people to scripture because that will correct us. That will mm-hmm. help correct our thinking and we need correct thinking on our own hearts and on our kids hearts too yeah this is where we want biblical categories we may have inadvertently adopted secular categories Mm -hmm. we want biblical categories and actually i'm going to give you guys a new category right now uh it's it's gentle tiger parenting (laughs) okay we've gonna right here on the Maven Parent Podcast, we are coining a new kind of no, p- we're not. A phrase for no, we're g- not gentle tiger. <laughs> and so, I mean, haven't you ever seen a tiger? He looks all cuddly. You want to no. cuddle up with him, and no. he's a gentle tiger. Gentle tiger is an oxymoron that this doesn't no. You've adopted, you don't get to just make up your own words, you've adopted Kunkel, secular or categories your own slogans. There. You don't get to do uh, that. Well, off camera here, I'm going to have to correct you on some of your. <laughs> your categories okay well hopefully we've laid a good foundation for where we're going here we're gonna we're gonna hit now i I think in in the next podcast uh now the connection between kind of heart and obedience and and those kind of things but this has laid a foundation we want to start really thinking about the heart in biblical terms and when we do that that's the first step that that good clear Christian worldview thinking is going to now guide us on how we can raise and disciple our kids.